pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us on a Saturday morning. Um, I'll acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Agro people. I'm in Ipswich. Um, I pay my respects to their um, elders past, present and emerging. So this book was a book that's just come out. It's hot off the press. It came out last month um, and it was put together as a result of working with another 11 historians. And we wanted to look at the historical approach to looking at disasters in Australia and New Zealand. So um, the question is, I'm asking is, why did we write this book? Now, we decided that despite Australia and New Zealand having a long history of fire and floods, there's actually very little written about these topics. Uh, some historians have looked at it, but it's largely been done by geologists and scientists. And we thought there was a need for an historical perspective. So this is to try and redress a gap. Um, it became fairly evident to us that it's, we're in a changing climate. I'm not telling anybody in the room who doesn't know that. And there is a, an increasing risk of disaster in Australia and around the world. Now, um, those who deny the reality of climate change often draw on history to bolster the claims that climate change is not real. And to do so, they often point to the fact that Australia has always had fires. And that's true. There's no doubt that that is true. Um, fires and floods are part of the Australian environment. I mean, Dorothea McKellar said in her poem, um, it's a land of floods and um, droughts and flooding rains, and she's absolutely right. But what we're seeing is actually quite different now. And emergency managers who'd worked with fires for 40 years described these recent fires in summer of 2019 and 2020 as unprecedented. And all the media kept saying that to the point that we're all sick of that word unprecedented, and it's still being used this year a lot. But I think it's true. Uh, they said that we've had increasing periods of hot weather, which means we get a much higher fire risk. The conditions in the bushland are much drier and there's becoming a smaller and smaller window of opportunity to do strategies like backburning and things that we've done for generations. So the mitigation strategies that we're using for fire are just not working. And so the nature of disasters in Australia is changing. And as an historian, I always think to understand change, you've got to know the evolution that's come before the past informs the present. So that's the reason for the book. Now, one of the reasons that disasters are going to be so much worse is that we've got warming seas. So as a result, cyclones will most likely travel further down south. Cyclones need warm water to feed them. And if the warm water is more available down south, these cyclones are likely to be more frequent and more intense. We're going to get rising seas from melting ice caps, which is going to increase the flood height. So just for example, even in the Brisbane River, imagine if the base of the river was one metre higher, then the floods are all going to be a metre higher and it will affect the tidal system. So they're real consequences. The weather is likely to become more extreme because heat is going to create more energy in the system. The cycles of La Nina and El Nino are going to make the dry periods longer and the wetter periods will be wetter. Droughts will probably become more severe and what will happen is these longer wet periods will grow more fuel for fires and then they'll have longer times to dry out. So when we get the fires, they are far more likely to be more intense. That was not a very cheerful way to spend a Saturday morning. I apologize for that, but that's what we're dealing with. Now, when we were writing this book, we were actually writing the introduction in December and January, which is a terrible time to try to be finalizing a book about disasters because every day it seemed we were changing it. I felt like we were jinxing the world. So White Island's volcano erupt. So that was the first thing that happened. So there was another little paragraph. Then the Binnaburra Lodge burnt down in the hinterland, you know, in a rainforested area. That's really quite frightening. Lamington National Park was really destroyed. And we thought, well, it couldn't get much worse. And then it did. And so Malakuta attracted global attention when, remember the images of the 4,000 people fleeing to the coastline and they had to get evacuated by, you know, the, the Navy. Now, the consequences of this fire are still being unraveled, but the Climate Council estimates that 11 million hectares burnt. Now, put that in context, that's more than South Korea. There were 34 direct deaths and 417 indirect deaths, largely from smoke. One billion animals were killed and some risk extinction. 54% of Guanduana rainforests in New South Wales and Queensland were destroyed and probably won't recover. And there were nearly 6,000 buildings destroyed. 
by 9th of November 2019, which is before the traditional fire season, so that's scary in itself, over 850,000 hectares were, in New South Wales alone were scorched by fire. And the one fire, the Gospers Mountain Fire, destroyed an area seven times the size of Singapore. So these are called mega fires, and it's the biggest fire in history so far from one single ignition point, which is, you know, quite terrifying. Now, the consequences are not all human. There's other, that's one of the things we want to upset in this book is that fires, we often talk about disasters as being very human centric, but they have a bigger effect on the planet beyond those that affect humans. And if you see these figures here, of estimated to up to around a million, a billion tons of carbon dioxide released into the air by those fires. That's the equivalent of a year's emissions from commercial aircraft. I mean, that's phenomenal. Um, air quality in Sydney was 12 times hazardous levels and 23 times in Canberra. You can see why people died from smoke. And it's estimated that it might have cost up to $50 million a day in Sydney alone, just from the smoke. The tourism sector was hard hit and the insurance claims are still probably coming in and so far they've, they think it's about 1.9 billion. So these are reasons even an economic rationalist should take disasters seriously. The consequences are huge. So when we wrote this book, this was our aim. You always have an aim when you write a book, whether you achieve it or not, it's another thing, but this was our aim. We wanted to build knowledge of the past so that we'd better understand the challenges of our uncertain present and our even more uncertain future. So disasters have become a thing that environmental historians look at, and I'm an environmental historian, but I also included in this book oral historians and memory scholars. So we try to look at an interdisciplinary approach, approach within the humanities fields. Um, and Ruth Morgan has put well, looked at why we should look at climate in particular. And this is a, a great quote here that I'll just read in case you can't see it clearly. And she says, the climatic conditions that we will face in the future will be new to us, but change itself isn't new. And environmental histories can shed light on how humans have responded to and understood environmental challenge in the past, change in the past, sorry. So um, what environmental historians do is that we reveal the anthropogenic origins of disaster without creating false distinctions between the human and natural world. So I want to explore those ideas today. So just to give you a little idea of what was in the book, we looked at two cyclones, Mahina in 1899, which is actually the worst recorded one, um, Yasi in 2011, the Canberra bushfires in 2003 and Black Saturday in Victoria, that was in a number of the chapters, the earthquake in Newcastle in 1989, and the Brisbane and Townsville and Waikato floods were covered. And the Waikato ones were particularly good because they also looked at the Maori perspective as well. So these are the two things that I thought I'd talk to you about today, because this is really what I think is very important when we're looking at dealing with, with climate and disasters. So I want to look at the idea of whether disasters are natural or unnatural. And also how do we remember disasters? Because I think remembering disasters is really important in creating change and for the future. It's, I, I have a belief that by remembering them, it'll help us inform change. That was something I wanted to explore in the book. Now, lots of people describe disasters like fire and flood as natural, but they aren't natural. They're not entirely natural, that's for sure. And that's something that we really need to get across to the general public. Um, while they may be triggered by a natural event, the term disaster itself is anthropogenic. Basically without humans, a cyclone is just weather. The, an earthquake is just the movement of tectonic plates. I mean, I use the really poor analogy of if a tree falls in a forest, it's not a problem. But if you're camping underneath it, it's not so good. So you put the human element in it before and it becomes a disaster. So we really, really need to reframe studies and discussions of disasters to make the point that to call a uh, disaster natural obscures the role of humans and the decisions we make in their production. Every day we make decisions that can sometimes make disasters better or worse. It's a choice. And as Ian White says, a region's vulnerability to disaster is partly the result of historical development paths and government processes. 
which have been determined by prevailing socioeconomic values. So again, I've got the bias of a humanities scholar, but I don't think you can understand disasters until you start understanding the culture in which they are occurring. So this is the book that came out last year from UQP. Um, and I argued that floods are regarded as a natural disaster and to a sense they are a natural event. They are part of the hydrological cycle of a river. You know, rivers in drought shrink and in floods they expand and they burst beyond their banks. But it's not an environmental disaster at all. I mean, what floods do is they rejuvenate a river system, they fix the riverine environment and they replenish the alluvial floodplains that we grow our food on. But it's only a disaster when somebody builds in its path. And in Brisbane's case, they've built an entire city. So the disaster is actually anthropogenic, as I said before. The hazard's actually caused by the human actions of building on a floodplain. That's actually the disaster, and that's why I don't think they're a natural event. So floods themselves might be natural, but the flood hazard is human created. Now there's a few factors I think you need to think about in this context and one of them is cultural factors. You decide to build near a river, you have a constant growth mentality, you might have lax development laws, there could be a political reluctance to deal with the issue and there might be the power of capitalism and the strong values of the, um, and power of the building and the real estate industry. They're just some of the examples of cultural factors that need to play into floods but they apply to fire just as much. There's social factors of collective memory. Do we remember our floods or we did choose to forget them? Do we actually believe that we are immune to floods? You know, for example, one that came up in my book all the time is Wyvernhoe Dam will save us. That's a really strong myth and it's a myth. Um, and the other is the dominant narratives of heroism and survival, superiority over nature. We talk about that a lot. I mean. We celebrated the Mud Army in 2011 and the Mud Army were fantastic. But we didn't talk about the fact that we needed to be so reactive because we'd been so bad at being proactive. You know, we didn't get out the way. We built there in the first place. So the stories we tell in the media and in our own imagination really shape how we deal with disasters. And I think the parallels with how we see and deal with climate change are just really, really obvious that um, the stories that we're fed definitely sway public opinion. So we also did a lot of oral history in this book. And it was really interesting to do oral history because it cuts across those dominant stories. You start getting the idea that there's a whole lot of different understandings and experiences of disasters across a whole lot of different community groups. And this starts ex exposing some really interesting vulnerabilities. And there's a whole lot of dimensions to disasters that don't come out through those dominant stories. They, your experience depends a lot on your class, your race, your gender, your socioeconomic status. So that needs to be taken into account. Uh, the other thing that oral history is really, really good at is challenging and complicating stories. And you start getting a much more nuanced understanding of the human and non-human relationships. And that's what environmental history does particularly. And one of the things that starts coming through when you look at oral history is what are the stories that are missing from some of the tales we always tell? The Aboriginal voices are missing often. The, the, the less articulate, non-English speaking people, the powerless. Their stories don't get recorded. And equally, we don't get stories from the non-human world. And one of the chapters in the book looks at the impact on the um, animals from Yasi and the destruction of their habitat and how that upsets the idea that disasters are always felt by humans and that's the only part that matters. And by disrupting these ideas, you start getting this idea that one size fits all policies just don't work. What might work for dealing with bushfire in Canberra doesn't work in Melbourne. It doesn't work in Gosper's mountains. So that's something that the oral history can do by looking at specific locales, realise that you have to deal with big problems at a local level. Um, and memory scholars look at the realise that there's a different temporal boundaries for disasters. So for lots of us, when the floodwaters go down or the fires go out, we get on with our lives. But for lots of people, 
they don't get on with their lives. And you can talk to the people in Malacuta at the moment and their lives are not anywhere near what they were in October last year. So memory scholarship looks at how lost objects and sites of memories, uh, our site of memories are interwoven with the trauma. Um, it examines how disasters are working with collective memory and in, in talks about the complexities of dealing with memory and how we deal with areas that are prone to these disasters. And as I've hinted before, it raises these big questions of whose memories are retained, whose stories do we tell, and do we just tell the popular narratives about survival, heroism, that we're all in it together, you know, we're all Australians, but are those accurate? I think they're a lot more complicated than that and not everyone has the same experience by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and we also look at memorials and in particular, they look at the Canberra fire and the Black Saturday fires and look at how we've dealt with memorials. So they look at how building memorials um, can, what, can, they complicate what we should commemorate and what purpose do they serve and what stories do they tell and, I, and we asked, you know, who are these built for? Are they built to commemorate those that have died, those that have survived, or our next generation or the people who are moving to the area so they're more risk aware? Because risk awareness is a really um, important tool in developing resilience. So I, I had this idea that public education was really important. But the question is, if you don't tell the right stories, are you educating or are you just sort of draw, drawing a line in the sand Right, we've commemorated that, let's get on with our lives, it's over and done with. Or does it have an ongoing community role? Does it raise public consciousness is what I wanted to know. Um, by telling people with these memorials, does it make people think about flood? Or is it just sort of background decoration? Again, what stories do we leave out when we write these memorial stories? There's a really great thing in the book of where they talk about some people refuse to recognise these memorials because it's not seen as their story. They don't recognise the stories that are told at all as being there. So sometimes memorials can divide a community more than keep it together, which is often the intent. Um, and the other thing that they can perpetuate myths and, and false memories, and that can be really dangerous. And as I um, keep coming across, you know, we have this idea that Brisbane's blood immune, if only we managed Wybenhoe Dam properly, and that's really dangerous because it's eroded people's memory and resilience. And by creating stories like that, people do have that idea of invincibility. So I'm going to finish up because my time is nearly over and I want you to have plenty of time for questions. But I just want to leave you with these, these things to think about. So as a historian, I really believe in the power of narrative. I think we need to tell stories of the past to illuminate the present and to guide our future. Now we have decades of scientific data that prove climate change. Um, and escalating disasters are just one component of how this changing climate will play out. But I think our challenge is to engage the public more. And then we have an even harder task of convincing the politicians of the need to act. And political will is really, really important. And I think that's what's missing from our scenario at the moment. And I think this is where we can draw on the humanities disciplines. History, literature, theatre, art, and much more can tell stories that engage with science. And sometimes that's a way of making the science more accessible. But I think scientists need to work more with humanities scholars as well. I think there's a silo approach at the moment. And I think... In when you've got a really big problem, you need to all act together. I think our planet depends on it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our CCL channel by hitting the button in the top left hand corner of this screen. Spread the word of CCL by using the share icon to as many of your contacts as possible. Thank you. See you next video.